So, musky pike. Yes. The biggest difference is there is a rattle in there. The main purpose is the weight. The noise definitely does not hurt. All right. And it has the potential to help. Um, the yard sale. Yes. Musky size. Musky size. What we're sitting Dude. here, video two in the se series. We're going to sit down with Matt and learn how to tie the big baits for the big fish. So it's really just... The way we're going to put the rattle in is different. The rest is scale. Okay. Right? So, Slightly more material. And kind of what we're talking about is that we covered the trout size in our first video, and we talked about weight displacement on the rear hook. And we're going to talk now about why we're putting a rattle in for the bigger baits. Mm -hmm. so if you didn't see the first one, and you want to learn a lot of the whys on the material, we went through in depth about How it all came this to be. setup. And now we're going to do a little bit quicker tie, and we're going to talk about the big baits. Yeah. And so, like, I'll, I didn't touch too much on the weight, and I'll do that real quick. So, and I'll just pick up one of the smaller ones. But that, to me, the thing I always envision that makes the most sense is a trailer full of wood that has too much wood. And yeah. when you do, and you try to drive that, anyone that's done that, especially if you're going down the hill, it feels like the trailer is driving you, right? So when you strip that fly and you put energy into it, just like if you were to throw something down the hill, the heavier it is, the longer it's going to take to stop. So the weight in the back and the, and the joint work together that as I pull this fly and put energy into it, the weight takes longer to stop the, because the back is pushing the front like a trailer with too much wood, it turns the fly, right? That's the point of the hinge and why we want that tight, con that um, sort of stiff connection turns forces the fly this way on the pause. Now, when we pull again, our line come into the flies like this, it has to turn it and pull it back the other way. So that's where like in still water, it's easier to maintain. Current aids your fly not going straight. So it can be a little bit harder to control left to right, but it should never go straight. This, that was one so. of the best scenarios when I first met you. I think it was, we were tying here in Grand Rapids yeah. and we we're sitting there and we we're talking, Miles was there. We were talking about this, and like I had done weight in the back, but I had not thought of it that way. And it's funny, even when I rent a trailer to move something for <laughs> my wife's gym, it? I think about tying a fly and where it's I got to put the weight all over the place. <laughs> that was always the bet. Like I always thought of the fly, the back's driving the front, and so like that was just the thing that trailer you have a hinge. Yeah. Right? Yep. Again, it's a hinge. It's not, if that was a rope connection from your yeah. trailer to your truck, you're not going to get the same. So that's stiff connection, mm -hmm. hinge, only left or right is essentially your movement. Another thing too, like people will say, a fly following up is just part of the game with articulate streamers, but it shouldn't be, right? Like this fly, that hook shouldn't be able to catch the front one, right? And so if this is... I see it all the time where there's a huge gap, like this loop around that rear eye is just enough for it to move, right? Yep. If it's too tight, you can back off your wraps a little bit, but too loose, and you can, I see all the time articulate flies you could tie in a knot. Yeah. So whether through casting or another thing, especially with browns and muskies do this too, they push so much water at the fly that if they miss it or their first intention wasn't to eat it, it can actually, the hydraulics can follow the fly up and now it's over. Yeah. Your game's over, you yep. know? Um, and sometimes muskies can push so much water as much as I try to prevent that they'll st still just get fouled up. It'll happen once out of every, who knows however many times, but it could happen. But it shouldn't be part of the game. So that tight loop controls the movement you want. Now, if you want a real slinky, leechy type movement, maybe that's what you want. Um, but that's not what I'm trying to accomplish with this. And as we go through this video again, I just want to thank Nomad Anglers for allowing us to sit here today and tie these flies. We're going to have links within the video in the description. Nomad Anglers is going to have separate pages so you can buy all the materials for this fly if you're into tying them. Also, I just want to let you guys know if you're not into tying them and you'd like to get a couple from Matt, you're starting a new website that yeah. is going to have some very unique colors yeah on there so adaptive fly right now is just like a list of the patterns i offer that you can order and the prices and turnaround time and stuff like that but i'm actually going to change it to be stuff like that that i tie that like colors i have in my head or inspiration of other colors that like maybe i've seen and i wanted to you know tie and get out of my head 
but I may not need or is a color that doesn't work in my region, but I, so I'm just going to sell them. Sure. So I'm literally going to list quantity of one. Yep. And when they're gone, they're gone, and yep. I may tie more of that yep. one. But some of the stuff with dyeing the feathers and and uh, really getting in depth with the markers, uh, I'm just going to list them on there. Every, obviously, you can still order flies, but those ones are not for ordering. Okay. They can't. They take way too much sure. time. They are going to be cost a little bit more than what I would typically yep. sell them at, but they between the dyeing and the coloring, there's a lot more time yep. that goes into them. All right. So, yeah. So in the next shoot, by the time this video comes out. Maybe I might even actually have it up. Bam. It'll be soon. We'll time it together. Should be by the end of yeah. February. All right. Yeah. We'll we say can that. work with that. You know, not, not to put any rush on no, you. No problem. But by the time we talk about this, hopefully it'll be out. So the rattle is, if I were to tie this right to the hook, and this is how I started out, it's such a small base to tie the rattle to that it's almost impossible to keep the rattle from wanting to roll onto one side of the shank or the other, whether through fishing, hitting the motor, uh, catching a fish. So I add a little bit of bucktail to create a little bit larger base. So again, really good thread base, so the bucktail doesn't want to roll. And I get kind of a small amount of bucktail and looking again, I'm going to tie the rattle right on top. This is where, like, again, with even the lead wire, they make little rubber collars mm -hmm. that you can, right, because this is a jig skirt rattle yes. for bass jigs, right? Um, they make a little rubber collar where you can hang it off the back, and I did try those because I was like, wow, it's way easier to start tying. You don't have this massive thing in the way. But the fly didn't swim the same. So, again, I think it's the, I think it's the weight forcing the hook to fight itself right. that helps. Um, it, they definitely did not swim as well when I hung the weight off the back. Maybe the energy doesn't transfer the same, I don't know. So I do want it right on the top of that, that hook, slightly hanging off the back. And I like the, this is a large size, these plastic rattles. Brass is too heavy to put here. Brass I found too, because I use them in some of the heavier jig flies. If they get dinged a little bit, whether through a fish or whatever happens to it when fishing and hitting the boat, then the ball won't roll okay. and it doesn't make any noise. Still have the weight, which is probably the most important part. Glass ones will break. Yep. You cannot fish flies this size with the amount of energy you have to put in the fly to cast it and have it not break. Right. So these plastic ones, unless the cap comes off, which usually only happens if you hit like a motor or the side <laughs> of the boat, which we've all found at some Oops. point how that can happen or... Clients, yep. <laughs> somebody, yep. even other guides. Yeah, <laughs> I still remember that. You're like, fly was fishing so well, and all of a sudden it stopped. <laughs> True. But it's, uh, <laughs> well, I wasn't going to name anybody. <laughs> the It has a metal cap in the back, and the ball is metal, and that's where these are, I think, the loudest. Too. Okay. Loudest with the least amount of energy to do it, too. So, uh, again, I don't think it hurts. It's not going to scare a pike or a muskie. Um, if anything, maybe it'll help them locate it. This is where, without getting down the rabbit hole, pushing water too much, n noise and how that that kind of travels through water is m more likely to get a fish's attention than the disturbance, okay. the, fly, the, the distance that that's able to travel, the distance a muskie can feel, which is on average um, the length of its body size. So a 40 inch muskie, can feel 40 inches away, right? So if you're already that close, you can probably see it. <laughs> another time. There you go. Another hour long video. <laughs> but uh, so I do like to add a little glue onto the thread where we tied in that bucktail, a little bit on top to kind of just hopefully reinforce this and have this stay in a spot. Because again, right on the top of the hook is where it typically is the best and really gonna lash that down. You want to make sure you get some wraps over the rattle itself. If you just do the collar, this can break. Okay. And that's what I used to do, because this is, seems like the easiest spot is right, on, the right on this collar here on the gap. But this, it'll, it'll break right at the base of that, and you'll just have that left on the hook. So definitely get some wraps over the rattle itself, and then it should be in place. But now it's like, how do we tie in the feathers? We got this rattle, so what I do is I create sort of like this tent on the back where I take a little bit more hair and this this I like to take hair from the top of the bucktail so it won't really flare and I'm just gonna lay it over the top and lash this down good and now we've created 
sort of like this taper like this so now it's going to hold our feathers like this as well right uh, and have a really good solid base to tie those feathers in on something easy we're back down to a narrow spot did i screw up the focus sorry i'm moving Slow around down. yeah we'll get it redone This is in this, you know, again, trial and error, which I think is how a lot of stuff in terms of fly design, the more trial and error you experience, the more it leads to other, you know, I don't know if I want to say innovations, maybe that is the right word, but other stuff that you didn't typically do before. And the, the more that you learn out of error versus just seeing it or someone telling you to do it, I feel like the more it helps you in the long mm -hmm. run. And this whole process was probably two or three seasons long, oh, yeah. you know? Um, of, t of tying a lot of flies before realizing like the best way to do things. Uh, again, for the feathers, now this is larger size, so we're gonna scale everything up a little bit, right? Like this is a rather long feather, but again, thick, webby, relatively stiff stem. Gonna do four again, so we're gonna pick out a few more that, that kind of match in shape and size. They don't have to be a perfect match. I think the mo the main part with using four feathers is make sure if you have like nice large ones that, you know, at least on there too, you can go with some little bit thinner ones, but make sure that you have at least two that are good solid size and they're relatively stiff. Again, I don't pull out, again, cosmetically, this isn't going to hurt you. Weight-wise, overall on the fly, while this will hold more water than this, it's you're going to lash most of that down. It's not going to be a problem. It's not going to affect the fly. But I feel like I found that if you strip it down to the stem on flies for pike and musky, it often makes it easier to get pulled out. Right. So it's just more to bind to. Once you have them lined up, make sure you don't take tight wraps back towards the back of the hook because then. You start to force the feathers weird. These need to be looser, tighter as you come forward, all the way up and lash those in good. You know, if you have a bunch of like the softer kind of stuff, you can trim it out if you want, but it doesn't matter. So we're gonna add some more flash. Again, like especially for pike and musky, I'm not at all concerned about the amount of flash. For trout and bass, I'd, you know, I may, I'm not concerned, but I'm not gonna overdo it. Uh, for musky, it's like, there was a way to just have the entire fly be flash and swim well. Yeah. That's the tough part. Yeah. It's hard, flash doesn't have great qualities for good action. It's just there and it's flashy, right. you know, it's so soft, so there's not a whole lot you can do with it. So I'll just go in kind of a, a very, very solid, even though this is this fly is going to be nine ten inches long, which is adequate for pike in some places, I'm going to go in some very solid pike colors here. We're going to do chartreuse white with a little bit of orange, which pike will eat anywhere that they live. That's one great thing about pike is if I want to tie something that's really cool in wild colors, I can just go feed it to pike because they'll eat it because I feel like they don't have a choice. <laughs> I feel like if Pike lived next to fast food restaurants, their <laughs> body fat would be 90%. <laughs> They're just like, oh, food, all the time. Never thought There's of food. it that way. <laughs> There's food. You know, it's funny because people like talk about fish being smart or dumb. And in the musky fishing world, we like to talk about how dumb pike are. Sure. But literally, I mean, fish are as dumb as their stomachs, right? Pike's metabolism is so much higher than a muskie's. So it literally is like can't pass up yeah. the opportunity. There's more pike. There's more Gotta competition eat. for food. Yep. They can't risk letting Joe eat that right. that chartreuse colored bait fish that very likely might not be real, but I can't help myself because what if it was real and Joe ate it? Now I can't eat for another five minutes. <laughs> this piker just seem like they're starving all the time, which is what makes them dumb. <laughs> they're just as dumb as their stomachs. A big 45 inch muskie may eat you know, a 12 inch sheep head and then not need to feed for two or three days. So it's like, you know, no big deal. I'll find food at some point. I'm bigger and better than everybody else. I don't need to be stupid. Um, but then you get into areas of higher densities where muskies are forced to be a little bit dumber because they can't risk somebody else eating their food. So really, I mean, that's the biggest difference between pike and muskie is the metabolism.
I just learned that today. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Well, right. You think about na nature is, I mean, she's pretty damn smart. Right. Uh, I had not thought of this. If Pike had, if muskies had the metabolism of Pike, there'd literally be no other fish left in the in the in the, <laughs> in the you know in that body of water because they're just big enough to eat everything. Right. Uh, there's there's a reason that they only need to eat every so often so that. Uh, the rest of the fish in that body of water have a chance to survive. It's also why they suck at spawning, right? Like pike are way more effective spawners. Mm -hmm. Muskies are terrible. It's like they don't give a shit. It's like the female literally just swims around like, oh, I'm going to drop my eggs here. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> and some male is like, oh, I got you. Maybe. <laughs> right? <laughs> and like, that's, it's, it's like three in the morning after the bar every night. Uh, at a at a frat house, it's like good luck, everybody. Some people are gonna be pregnant, some aren't. Um, but yeah, muskies terrible, terrible spawners. But by nature's design. So we're kind of got sidetracked a little bit on the <laughs> metabolism <laughs> of pike and muskie. And if we went through something, and we're not gonna talk about it, but you can always reference back to the other video on the trout right. size yard sale uh, as we're going through the musky size here we're just trying to go a little bit quicker cover some of the basic principles the flies exactly the same just changing yeah. the size a little bit and we'll talk a little bit about probably more behavior tactics between between musky and pike is you know we're with one of you know the innovators of that species i feel especially for this I mean, area i appreciate it I know. uh but it like it's one of those things like my brothers and I, we were very fortunate to grow up in a fishing family. Like my, I think I was in high school before I realized people took vacations that weren't centered around hunting or fishing. Fishing, um, some of them like, well, going on vacation. I'm like, where are you fishing? <laughs> what are you about? We're going to sit on a beach for several days. I'm like, what, who does what? that? So my mom, very good angler and hunter. So was my dad and they were always, I've met so many people in my life that go fishing and so many times they do the exact same thing and they're just like well it wasn't happening today but that's not how my parents mm -hmm. fished they were always we you know growing up especially during you know late 70s 80s you everything that you caught you were going to eat that was why you fished and um all right so if it wasn't working this one's important we're going to starve yeah. yeah so the family of six we ate everything that we caught or killed. So now this is gonna be a little bit different in that we're not gonna use mono because mono doesn't take much for a tooth to catch that. Um, here's our public service announcement, right? From Smokey <laughs> the Bear, only you can prevent bite offs. Uh, please use wire. wire. Uh, please don't use floral or mono. I mean, I say that, but yeah, sure. If you want to use a 130 pound floral leader, uh, I've even heard of 120 getting bit through. Not on a fly rod, is, but on gear rods. But um, and try to fish a fly though on like 120 floral, and good luck with the action. Um, please, please use wire for pike and musky. It's um, if they are not leader shy. I always I talk about this. I've told this story a million times because the picture cracks me up of a buddy of mine in Utah who took a picture of a guy holding up a stringer full of crappie on a metal stringer and there's like a 38 inch tiger muskie holding on to one of the crappies still and he has it out of the water and he's poking it with the butt of his rod. And my buddy takes a picture of it, you know, he's like, get off there. Like when they want to eat, gonna... they do not give a shit what it's attached to. Um, so please, please, please use wire. Uh, if you, it, at the very least, don't risk losing a fish that you put in a ton of time for, a fish of a lifetime, uh, to a bite off. Or, the, or if you claim to care about the fish, please don't leave a 10 inch fly in a fish and think that it's gonna be fine or that it'll just come out. If you get a super clean bite off and the hook's never buried, it'll probably spit it out. But if you've hooked that fish and you're fighting it, it's not flat, that is not a six out's not rusting out nor does it happen in fresh water anyways we'll be writing all these down for our next four hour video <laughs> <laughs> hooks don't rust out in fresh water <laughs> before the fish dies no okay all right on to tying this so i use 65 for this connection i use 65 pound seven by seven strand coated wire and there the reason for that is i like 
seven by seven strand coated wire because it's flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, in that, if a fish is on the back hook, you know we have some give here than on this super tight hinge uh, of that fish because the head shakes on a muskie are are huge. So to not free that hook, we have some something to work with. And sixty five pound is stiff enough that when you're swimming that fly, you keep a stiff connection here. So 65 pound is where I've kind of landed of what I like to use. As you know, seven by seven strand coated uh, is very, very knottable. Awesome, awesome leader material. I noticed you didn't fold that back because it'll bind in. Yeah, you, you know, you can, but this is so large, you're creating this right. big bulky thing. You totally can, but never ever had the back hook pull out and when you talk about between my brothers and i i mean you're talking yeah, I about your hundreds flies. i mean yeah I so have you confidence. alone hundreds of right yeah right. well yeah i wish but i mean it's just more like yeah. i have the confidence in it yeah it was just more something that i noticed because yeah. i haven't watched you tie this before yeah. but i was like oh it makes sense that he's not folding it back probably bulk yeah is one thing and then the coating the coating it bites. The size. Yep. yeah if the coat you can bite into that coating again always a good thread base strong wraps you're going to bite into that coating yep. on the wire yep. if this was not coated this would be so slick because yes. i bought it by accident where it didn't you know you need to <laughs> specifically buy the coated yes um and it won't bite into it and it's super slick and it's stiffer um but yeah get it i i do add glue you know just again foolproof uh but i mean just this year Eric had where between him and his clients they landed over 30 fish on a fly and it you know several I mean numerous on the back hook and never once pulled out good way to test it is you can put it on your cleat and really yeah. reef on it no that's why well, back when I used to use a different wire um, the code it doesn't seem to rust as okay. easy I don't know uh, I used to use what was called steel on which is yep. an actual steel leader material and that would break okay to the point to where we would if it was a fly I felt like it was a couple years old would test it on the cleat and even then have some break so but this flexible coated seven by seven uh, have not had one break ever have never broken it on a fish either uh, I typically use probably use 40 pound the most um, 30 on smaller flies can sometimes be beneficial. I've never broke 30 either, so, but on, um, but why not use 40 if right. you could? Yep. But on sometimes, you know, during certain times of the year where smaller flies work better, especially in the spring, um, you can get a little bit better action on the 30 pound on a seven inch fly than you can the 40. So yeah, gonna repeat the process. Again, a much larger hook, so we're gonna do four rounds on this one. Just gonna kind of work on that shape that we want. Always binding that down pretty tight. And I like to I like to go on try to get it even on both sides of the hook. I don't. I've tried in um, kind of the saltwater method of tying some on one side, folding around the other side, but it just because this the flash and slinky, then it ends up being kind of out to the sides and doesn't swim as well. So, you know, if you catch a fish or something, this could, as you probably know, all the material can kind of shift to one side, mm -hmm. just take two seconds and kind of even it back out. That's what we call a mangled fly. Before. Yeah. Oh, well done. <laughs> Get your hats at mangledfly.com. <laughs> mangled fly is always a good thing, as long as it's not from your cast. Right. Also possible. It can happen. <laughs> You learning something, Justin? Oh, yeah. Taking notes. <laughs> Trying to figure out how much lead wire you have to use to fish this on a Euro rig. Can you cast this with a three way? Sure. You probably could. I was about to say something I probably shouldn't say on video, but. <laughs> I think they call this the anchor, right? <laughs> Yeah, you just put your nymph above this. <laughs> a little bit higher in the water column, your emergers. There was so, like, if 
anybody that's ever, a lot of people probably don't know Mark, who's my younger brother, because he's not, obviously, Eric, between, like, guiding and stuff, like, people know who he is, and they mistake each other, all the, us, all the time, like, people ask me if I have any open dates, and they'll ask Eric how much for flies, um, <laughs> but, uh, um, Mark is, a lot of people don't, he's, doesn't put himself out there at all, but, um, is every bit of the same angler as Eric and I are, and, uh, he would literally fish two flies this size sometimes just to see what would happen. And he would sometimes catch fish. Sure. Yeah, and to watch him cast two of these, uh, sometimes one a little bit smaller because he's like, it'll be like it's chasing a bait fish. Yeah. Uh, and then, I've, I've then, it would, then he would catch a fish and whether or not it, that was the reason why, who no. knows. But I'm like, now I could see your musky swimming around and then a giant white fly out <laughs> yeah. in front of it too. He's like, what if I get two? <laughs> like fishing for white bass. The key to catching two white bass at the same time is fight the other the one for a while <laughs> till the second one grabs it. I was like, only Mark would, he was always the one that would be, what if I tried this? You know, Eric, Mark, and I always benefited from each other, no doubt, because mm -hmm. we all of our brains work slightly different. You know, Eric, being the engineer, his like brain works like an engineer's brain was, and, you know, he figures out a lot of stuff because. A, you know, A plus B should equal C, so mm -hmm. if we do this, and then, like, I was always the one that was more, like, like, kind of, uh, creative. yeah, maybe creative or trying something maybe a little bit different, and Mark was just, like, all, all thrown into one. He's a mechanic, so, like, he sure. understands the way things are supposed to work, but he also gets, Mark and I have this thing where we get bored easily, so he'd be like, what if I throw two flies? <laughs> We're not seeing shit anyways. <laughs> Watch out, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and then it would work. Uh, so there's no doubt that the, the three of us benefited a ton from fishing with each other over the years. So now we'll just do the head and we'll, we'll color this one even a little bit more for fun. Do you want me to wait, Eric? Are you good? No, you can. I will, I, I'm trying to think, I mean, I tried to cover a lot of the questions I get. I will on um, this one, because this just made me think of it. The way that I will do some of the heads where you get kind of the blend of the colors up front, mm -hmm. um, I get asked a lot, so I'm gonna do that on this one, because it's relatively simple once you see it one time. And I'm just going to tease this out like we did on the first one. And you'll find like all colors of laser depth, some are a little bit different. Some of the fibers are a little bit longer. Some like black are very short and kind of uh, the other materials mixed in or be a little bit like kind of kinkier. And um, so it just depends. Some are just got to kind of mess with them and try it out. So I'm going to do like kind of a blended orange up front. So I'm going to take white and some orange. I'm going to do the same process of teasing it out and pulling it back together. So this is going to create kind of our faded orange. Again, doesn't help you catch more fish, but if you want to put some things into your fly that you enjoy, this is an easy one to do. So now when I tie this in and I color the front of it, it's going to have that, that kind of fade of color. Um, that is just fun for the point of when you go to pull your fly out of the fly box and you're like enjoy something that you did as if you're musky fishing and you may go the whole day without a musky showing any interest in it at least every time it comes back to the boat you can be like oh that oh. looks good oh, right, <laughs> right? and confidence right now, right? Right now. confidence like oh that one's got a little orange on it maybe that'll be it and honestly like for as you know for musky i mean so so important to keep your head in it the whole time and for me a lot of times it is the little things that I put into a fly um, that help whether it's the one I decided to pick you know um, that I think may make a difference again if you want to get picky you can come and trim out the bottom here a little bit it won't make a difference in how it fishes uh, so now, grab a marker so we have that kind of faded orange. Something 
of stuck in there. And now if I come in here and color the front and kind of taper it back, darken up the front a little bit, we get that kind of blended look, that kind of that gradient. So relatively easy. Color this top Genius. a little bit. That's how I look at it. Genius. It's, uh, it's my graphic design days. <laughs> Great. When I was in the... I graduated in 2001 and gradient was huge. Like Eric knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> gradient, bevel, shadowing, right? All of that stuff in Photoshop. So this, yeah, oh yeah, that was huge. Bevel was a was a big one. Orbs, you remember orbs? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mul with and making emboss. it with multiple layers. Oh yeah, yeah. So now that I don't design websites anymore, um, this gives me that creative outlet. And again, these Prisma color markers hold to these materials really, really well. I used to use Sharpies, but you'd have to like often recolor the fly mm -hmm. after fishing it. This, you usually don't have to. You know, and you can, if you want, depending on how you do this, you can come in because you're, depends on how deep you want that color. You can try to color the fibers underneath, but it all depends. Um, we could come in here with this marker and color the sides and put the bars on the sides, but at risk of coloring on Justin's table, I'm just gonna throw some bars up front. So what I like to do on this is go thick on the top and narrow down the sides. Again, only because I think it looks nicer. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've never had a muskie be like, mm, those bars are really tapering out there. I don't know, I don't know. I'm gonna pass on this one but I think it has a nicer look when it's a little bit thicker on the top and tapers down. And always like, if we're doing anything like with bars, pull, so you're getting the under fibers too and not just on the top. Cause you'll see I'm kind of holding it tight right now, but when you let go, it'll give you a good indication of how it's gonna look. So when you kind of go and brush this out, if they're not dark enough, just come in and make sure you get those ones underneath. And again, this will hold like I should never have to recolor that again. Now we're going to put eyes on this. Again, like I think. This would be a, you know, a question that someone, you know, I'm curious as well, but size mm -hmm. of the eye. Yeah. It so looks like you're buying them off a, like a, almost like a lure sheet. Yeah. What we used to do for spoons. Yes. Because they do go through quite a few yep. of them. Uh, so on yes too big of an eye and you've added too much weight to the front mm -hmm. right too small of an eye and it just looks weird mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't know any other way to right. put it than that it looks weird sure. so on um, these typically on you know this fly is going to be probably it's going to be in that nine to ten inch range these are half inch eyes on um, the smaller um all the smaller sizes they're like like uh well, I will say this, on the bass and trout size and on the mini size, those are 3 8 eyes. Mm -hmm. But if I were tying a, uh, a little bit, the amount of material I'll use, pencil measurement, sure. on a trout and bass will be less than I would on a pike. Because mm -hmm. the pike, if I'm gonna be putting the rattle back there, I have more material I gotta move, so I want a little more weight. And I can, as soon as I can get away with the weight of the rattle, I'm putting it in. Right. If, if there was a good size rattle that worked well for trout and bass, I absolutely would put mm -hmm. it in. I mean, the back in the day, like the the suspended rapalas with the rattles in them that oh, you could bomb yes. a mile on braid. <laughs> oh, you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, all that that clanking around in there, they used to, they used to eat the shit out of that. Um, but I haven't found a good size rattle that that really helps the fly swim the way that I need it. And I don't. I th again, I think you can. I think it's more important for pike and muskie. Um, so that will, if I, if, if it's a little bit larger fly to where I need a rattle, I'm doing the half inch eyes. So you can see just like size wise, if I were to do the three eighth eye on there, it'd, uh, it'd be yeah. tiny. It'd be yeah. look weird. Yeah. It wouldn't even, it would see weird. And if I put this on that fly, not only would it look weird, but it, you put so much weight into the front that the fly... You know, this fly, if you left it sit there long enough, of course it's going to start yeah. sinking at some point, but I don't want it to sink. I want it when it comes out of that to really hang there for a second before maybe it goes into a slow drop. Um, but if I had a giant eye on there and the weight of the eye and the glue, 
is just going to make it want to fall and I'm going to lose the action I'm trying to get out of it. So that's about a probably nine, nine and a half inch. There you go. Well done. Um, musky pike size. And again, I, this color I'm sure works in some regions. I wish it worked well here because <laughs> chartreuse is just fun. <laughs> but unfortunately, whether it's our water co color or whatever it is. But this is, if I could pick one color for pike, this is probably it. There you go. As you said, they can't pass it up. No. No, they can't. No, especially if it's chartreuse, it's practically cheating for pike. <laughs> <laughs> it's like if I try all their colors for fun and I'm not getting any pike, I'm like, just put on chartreuse. There you go. Get them. <laughs> They'll eat it. Well, thank you, Matt. Again, everybody, if you're looking for the materials, uh, there's going to be a link here that you can get them through Nomad Anglers for sure. Uh, definitely stop by uh, Adaptafly and check out some of the very creative flies. They're quantity of one, so first come, first serve. That should be up there pretty soon. And uh, follow Matt for us on Instagram. He's got a great feed going on. Thank you so much for watching the video. Any questions, comment below, and we'll get them answered for you. Thank you so much. All right.